um, start our recording. Great. So welcome to those of you who are joining us. Um, as I just mentioned, this is a pretty informal um, event. We wanted to host a member exclusive event for our Santa Cruz County Business Council members and our Monterey Bay Economic Partnership members. Um, we're going to be recording just the first half of this event um, with the presentations that our guest speakers are doing, and then we'll end the recording and just kind of open up the floor for discussion and questions. Um, and so uh, let's see, we're getting a few people on here, which is great. I think we'll go ahead to um, the next slide and I'll just quickly go over the agenda while hopefully people are logging in. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we'll do some introductions. Uh, we'll have a quick overview of apprenticeships, kind of the nuts and bolts and what they are for those of you who maybe weren't able to attend our last apprenticeship event. Um, and then we'll hear from our local community colleges, Cabrillo College and Hartnell College. We'll each give us kind of a five minute overview of the local registered apprenticeships that they have already established in our region. It's really exciting work that they're doing. And then we'll end the recording and that will be our time. That's just an open Q&A with our guest panelists. And um, we'll try to have plenty of time where we wanna make sure we're leaving a good, you know, 20 minutes for Q&A with these experts on apprenticeships. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap it up and I'll share a few resources at the very end. So um, for those of you who are just joining, my name is Haley Mears. I'm the Workforce Development Program Manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today. We have Adele Burns. She's the Regional Director of Apprenticeships with the Bay Area Community College Consortium. So she's serving 28 community colleges in the region. And that includes the three in our region, Cabrillo College, Hartnell College, and Monterey Peninsula College. And then from our college partners, uh, we have Terry Opreza, who is uh, working with the internship and work experience at Cabrillo College and she's also computer information systems faculty. And now, uh, last but not least, Rosie Armstrong, who's the Director of Workforce Development, Agriculture and Healthcare Sector Partnerships at Hartnell College. And so I'm excited to have them join us today. Um, and I'll just pass it over to Adele to get us started with this overview of apprenticeships. Wonderful. Um, glad to be here and glad to have this nice this nice group here. Um, I welcome folks to put questions in the chat as we go. Um, obviously, the intent of this is to have this nice smaller session where we can have more dialogue and more conversations. So um, please feel free to add your questions and we will, you know, like Haley said, we'll have lots of time at the end for a conversation. Um, so um, I hope to give you a quick overview of what is apprenticeship, just to give you kind of a definition of terms in case any of this is new to you. And then I hope to also um, give a little bit of sort of guidance as to if you're interested, how might you get started? And what is some of the funding landscape look like? And just what are some of those initial steps for you to get started? Um, and then I'm really excited that we have um, my colleagues here from Cabrillo and Hartnell to offer some real world examples of programs that have been set up in the region. So I'm excited. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, there is a big emphasis on building apprenticeships in California. And um, there's a very big goal that's been put forth by uh, Governor Newsom to have 500,000 earn and learn apprenticeships by 2029. And I will say when he first uh, put this out there in maybe 2018, I think it was, a lot of people were like, oh, that's a lot of lip service. I don't know how we're ever going to make this happen. But what I will say is that uh, it takes time to take something from a vision into implementation. And what we're really seeing, and it's really been exemplified in the most recent budget, both at the state and federal level, is a lot of resources and a lot of um, Sort of infrastructure of support to actually make this happen. Um, and I am part of that infrastructure of support. I'm the regional director of apprenticeships for the Bay Area. And so I am here to be a resource to you all as you think about creating programs. So that's part of the infrastructure. And I'll also tell you a little bit more about some grant programs that are out there to help you get started. So if you go to the next slide, um, so just a definition of terms on what is an apprenticeship. So on the next slide, um, 
An apprenticeship fundamentally, what I'm talking about here is a registered apprenticeship and the core building blocks of a registered apprenticeship are the on the job training and the classroom instruction. But really first and foremost, an apprentice is a full-time paid employee of the company that is hosting them. Um, so it is first and foremost a job, which is why it always starts with the employers, which is why I'm thrilled to have this conversation here today. And, um, and it's about identifying that job that you could turn into an apprenticeship, which creates a different pathway into your organization. And the apprenticeship itself has the on the job time, which works out to be about a year of full time work. So 2000 hours is the typical apprenticeship. And that's a, a year of working full time. And that is then complemented by 144 hours of classroom based instruction. And you'll sometimes see this acronym RSI, which refers to related and supplemental instruction. And what that's referring to is just the, the classroom based component of the training. So if you go to the next slide, um, so this classroom based instruction, the idea of it is that it is sort of the formalized education to be upskilling somebody and helping support them to be effective in their role, right? And they are working at the same time and upskilling. And so these classes should be complementing that. So the idea is that a program gets designed in collaboration with an educational partner so that you're setting up those classes. Um, it could be with a college. Obviously, we're going to hear some examples of some college programs, um, but there is some flexibility in how that educational component is set up. And then on the next slide, the on the job portion is certainly a very important part that I want to be clear about what that entails. Um, so the on the job part is really articulated through what's called a work process, which essentially you can think about like a job description, but it's describing what an apprentice is going to be learning on the job, because obviously there's a lot of learning by doing that happens in an apprenticeship. And there should be a designated mentor, somebody who's training that person on the job. Um, this could be a supervisor or it could just be an experienced person holding the role, which in apprenticeship speak we call a journey person. Um, and a key component of an apprenticeship is that there needs to be an articulated skills progression that maps to some amount of wage increase. Um, there needs to be just at least one wage increase. There can be multiple, but um, this sort of maps back to that work process where you're saying, what are they gonna learn on the job? And then what's their, their compensation, steps of compensation gonna be? And an apprentice can start off at as little as 50% of what a journey person is making. Um, but the minimum wage is still the floor, so you can't go below minimum wage. Um, and then the idea is that with that wage progression, they're culminating in making about 90% of what a journey person would be making on the role in the in the job. So this is the really the core building blocks of what an apprenticeship is. And if you go to the next slide. Um, when you're thinking about setting up an apprenticeship program, there are really two primary types of registered apprenticeship programs that you can set up. The one that you might be most familiar with is um, a time-based program, which is the progression in the apprenticeship is measured entirely by just time working, right? So um, that's the, where you have the 2000 hour minimum and the 144 hours of RSI. Um, now, this and just a note that this could actually be over the the intent of this is that it's over the life of the apprenticeship so the 2000 hours it could actually be spread out over 18 months or two years or it could all just be in one year um, but there's flexibility but that floor is it's not like in a single year but over the life of the apprenticeship um now uh a different type of program is a, what's called a competency-based program. And in this program, the, your, an apprentice's progression is measured by their demonstrated competencies on the job. And um, it's ideal if these competencies can be measured by a third party certification. Um, so for example, like in the health sector, you might get a certain, there's many certifying bodies, for example. And if you can get that competency validated by that third party certification. It kind of makes it easier to build a competency based program, not required, but just helpful. Um, but anyhow, the competency based program can be as little as six months in duration or 1000 hours on the job time. Um, so that's nice. It creates a little bit of flexibility in when you're designing a program. 
um, that it can that it could be as little as six months long. Um, but that one also, of course, has the 144 hours of RSI is still required in that one. And then you can have a hybrid program that might be kind of a combination of the two above. So these are the different types of apprenticeship program that you can think about um, designing. And uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, as an employer, I think it's certainly important to think about what is the ROI on apprenticeship. Um, this was one particular study that was done by the US Department of Labor. And um, it's actually not done in California. It was done, I think, in Michigan. Um, I note that because uh, in Michigan, they don't have the level of funding for apprenticeship that we do in California. So the investment on the side of the employer is more than it would be in California. But even when there is a significant investment, there is still a huge ROI. So for every dollar invested in apprenticeship, it returned a dollar 48. And really where this is recognized is in the upskilling of your talent, right? You've got them not only training on the job, but with classroom training. So you're really getting more productivity out of your entry level talent. And when you invest in that entry level talent, they tend to stick around longer. And that's really where a lot of employers have seen so much value in apprenticeship is that um, talent sticks around, which then lowers recruitment costs, lowers training costs. Um, so this is a bit of where uh, employers are really seeing the value and the return on investment of apprenticeship. If you go to the next slide. Um, so as an employer, I think the big benefits of apprenticeship, um, of course, you're getting a skilled workforce and you're you know, in partnership designing a pipeline to get folks skilled and into your jobs right, and designed to meet your specific operational needs. So that's pretty cool. Um, so obviously getting great talent and upskilling for your particular needs. Um, I will say one of the things that I get really excited about with apprenticeship is that it creates a different pathway into your organization that is an earn and learn pathway. And when you create the, this pathway, you're not saying to folks, I'm sorry, you have to forego earning and just get a degree and maybe even go into debt to get that degree and then you can get a job with us. Instead, you're saying, no, come get a job, we will train you, we'll get education to complement that and get you into a job more quickly. And for those who cannot forego earning, this is a huge opportunity. And the result is that when you create apprenticeships and you create this pathway into your organization, you end up increasing diversity. You're able to attract and train and retain talent from a more diverse set of experiences that don't depend on the privilege to be able to get that degree first. Um, so I get really excited about that. Um, of course, there is a cost reduction, right? That goes back to the ROI that I talked about with um, you know, reducing recruitment costs, reducing turnover costs, um, and you know, you're paying somebody commensurate to the skills that they have, which on day one is not a lot of skills. Um, and then you're increasing their pay as they get more skilled on the job. And um, what's also really cool about apprenticeship in California is that basically the government of California has said, we will pay for the training component of an apprenticeship. So the classroom-based um, portion is really paid for by the state of California. Um, which is pretty phenomenal. So that also reduces some of the costs to the extent that you as the employer were picking up the training costs for some of your early stage talent. Um, creating an apprenticeship out of it shifts that training cost. Um, and then of course, loyalty, right? When you invest in people, they stick around. So I think these are really some of the big benefits um, for employers. If you go to the next slide. So hopefully at this point, you're feeling very intrigued at this prospect and you're thinking about, well, okay, so I'm sold on this concept of apprenticeship. How do I get started? Um, an apprenticeship always starts with the employer. It always starts with the employer need and the employer identifying a role within your organization that you think you can turn into an apprenticeship. And maybe you have an internship program that you wanna shift over into becoming an apprenticeship program, or maybe there's just an, an entry stage, an entry level role that you think could be turned into an apprenticeship. 
So it's identifying that role and that operational need. That's definitely the important first step. Identifying that, you know, what is the wage scale that you can offer? Um, the next step is identifying the educational partners. Um, in the state of California, you do need to work with a local education agency in order to get approved as, an, as a registered apprenticeship. Full disclosure, uh, at the, if you register only with the US Department of Labor, they do not have the same requirements. So um, if that is something that is important to you, then um, you know, if you have some private training provider that you absolutely wanna work with, you can get DOL registration. Um, so, but I am here hopefully to be a resource to you in finding the educational partner that makes sense to you. And you do have three fantastic community colleges in your region. Um, and so uh, identifying that educational partner is really important. And I'm certainly here to be a resource in that. And then you're, you're convening that educational partner and your business need and starting that conversation as to how could we design this program together. Um, you want to identify your employment streams. So who are you going to be recruiting from? I think working with a community college is a great um, place to be recruiting folks from. So I think that's another great reason to be working with them. Um, but maybe you have incumbent workers that you're wanting to upskill, or maybe there's some other pipeline of talent that you want to tap into. Um, and then you wanna be establishing your standards. So that's defining that work process that I talked about earlier, along with the learning plan that you would develop in collaboration with the educational partner. And then really with those components, you can then file your standards with, um, and you can either register with the California Division of Apprenticeship Standards and or the US Department of Labor. And they've actually made it very easy to, to dual register. Um, there's a single form that you can fill out to dual register. And you might ask, well, what's the benefits of registering for one or the other? Honestly, funding is probably the biggest one, <laughs> um, is getting funding to get your program going. So I'll touch more on that. Um, yes, great. So really with an apprenticeship, um, it's different from your average hiring because you do have to get a few different stakeholders to the table to set up an apprenticeship. And um, you as the employer, it definitely all starts with the employer and the employer's needs um, and articulating that need. And I talked a lot about the, you know, identifying the local education agency. And there will also often be an intermediary or a program sponsor. Um, this after, today we'll hear two examples of apprenticeship programs. Um, one I think is more on the traditional side and works with a union, right? Like the electrical union has historically played the role of this intermediary or program sponsor. And they're the ones who are often convening the stakeholders. They're the ones who actually register the occupation with DAS. And I think intermediaries, program sponsors, unions, they can play a really fantastic role in sort of reducing the overhead and admin, the administrative overhead of doing an apprenticeship from the employers so that the employers don't have to worry about that. Um, now, in this new and innovative space of apprenticeships, as we think about expanding it beyond the building trades, right? So the building trades have utilized this mechanism of, of workforce development for a very long time. And I think there's a really cool opportunity now to take this mechanism and apply it to all different parts of our economy. Um, However, in doing so, there's not always that immediate obvious union partner to work with, which is fine. I think there's, there are moments where um, the community college will step in and be that intermediary also. We'll hear from Cabrillo about that. They have waded into those waters. Um, there's also examples sometimes like a nonprofit um, or, or other entities will become the intermediary and will do that sort of aggregating of employer needs. Um, I think there's an interesting model to look at in the San Luis Obispo region. As I think about the Monterey and Santa Cruz region, I think about this group called Slow Partners, which um, has been set up and it's sort of, it's a geographically regional apprenticeship intermediary model. Um, and I think it might be an interesting one for the Monterey Santa Cruz region to consider, but anyhow, so. You might have this intermediary, the employer, the local education agency, and then you are, oh, great, thank you, Emmy. Um, 
and then you're registering your occupation with either, like I said, I talked already about the DOS, DOL and DAS registration. And then of course we're doing all of this uh, both for the employer needs and also to create this opportunity for the apprentice, right? To be working, to be learning and upskilling and really importantly to be earning. Um, so those are really the major stakeholders. And just to touch very quickly on the, the funding side of things. Um, so we have these key stakeholders on the left here, the employers, the intermediary and the community college and kind of what they're doing in the equation. Um, the expectation in apprenticeship is that the employers are paying the wages for, of the apprentices and they're doing the on the job mentoring and on the job training. So there is an expectation that pretty much 100% of the wages is gonna be covered by the employers. And that's really where your investment in this equation is. Um, however, in the state of California, there is a lot of funding to pay for definitely to pay for the training component of things and also often to pay for sort of the intermediary work that administration of the program so um, if you sort of skip to the bottom of this you'll see that the community college or the training partner those funds um, there's apportionment funding which is what community colleges receive for training students and you the community colleges can now get apportionment funding for apprentices. And actually, if an apprentice enrolls in community college classes, their fees are completely waived. So the education is, is free to the apprentice, free to the employer, and the college does recoup that cost from the state. So that's pretty amazing. Um, the traditional funds often used for training is RSI funding. Um, and there's also employment training panel funding. So this is there's a bunch of buckets of funding here. And I've sort of, I've color coded these potential funding sources by what's only in California and what is um, available nationally. So um, you can only access the funds in California if you do work with that local, with a local ed education agency partner. So that's just a key component to keep in mind. Um, but I will also say, um, if you go to the next slide, um, I don't even think I, there's a funding opportunity that literally came out yesterday. I don't think I got to update the slides in time. There is this, this funding opportunity, which is the EDA Good Jobs Challenge, which is um, a big grant opportunity that is currently open. Um, applications are due January 26th. But if you go to the next slide, um, this slide, I am very happy to announce that this funding has just been released. So hot off the press is that um, the California Apprenticeship Initiative has released this grant as they uh, had forecasted when I put together this slide. Um, and so it is open and indeed applications are due December 17th. And I'll be sure to put that link in the chat here. So there is a funding opportunity open right now for um, uh, it's up to $500,000 in seed funding for new apprenticeship programs. And according to my calculations, there's somewhere between 75 and $90 million that the chancellor's office has to administer in apprenticeship grants. So basically, if you've got a solid idea of a program and you have an educational partner to, you know, and you have those stakeholders that we talked about and you submit an application, I will kind of be surprised if you don't get it. Um, we'll see, maybe I'm wrong about that, but um, they have a lot of money to get out the door. And so, um, this is a huge opportunity to get some startup funding for your program. If you go to the next slide, I think I hand it over. So Terry, over to you to hear about your amazing program at Cabrillo College. Thanks Adele. And there was a question in the chat actually, um, someone found the link for that grant funding opportunity and they were asking, is this the one? Yes, that looks like I the one. It, I believe the answer is And yes. I will, yeah, I'll put in the link also while you, while you present. Thanks, Thanks you, so Terry. Thanks, Adele. That was an extremely succinct overview of apprenticeships. And I wish that I had known all of that four years ago when we started on this journey. I could have gotten a lot more done. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So Cabrillo College, prior to me joining Cabrillo, um, a little over 
three, almost four years ago, um, embarked on an initiative with the American Apprenticeship Initiative and a grant that was shared, was, was applied for and shared between five community colleges um, for technical apprenticeships, specifically IT apprenticeships. And the goal for us in Santa Cruz was really to bring a tech hub into Santa Cruz because the challenge in tech is finding employees in general, but even more challenging in Santa Cruz County um, because there are lucrative jobs over the hill. And I had one of those for many years. Um, but even um, so that this continues to be a challenge and even more of a challenge with the pandemic changes, currently they're projecting an 11% growth in information technology and computer jobs between now and 2029. And the average income is higher than average, um, which is also a nice carrot. And there are a lot of skill gaps between the college curriculum and the job requirements. And that skill gap is not just um, only with community college um, curriculum. It's also four-year college. I was a hiring manager um, at a software company in Mountain View for 23 years. And it was not uncommon that students that were just out of college did not have the job experience that we were looking for. And apprenticeships can help to bridge that skill gap. And um, I worked with De Anza College in my, to hire into my team at uh, my company for many, many years. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, so why the apprenticeships and what does, how does the community college help in bridging these gaps? So as Adele mentioned that oftentimes apprenticeships do start with the employer. However, in our case, the apprenticeship program started with Cabrillo um, getting that grant funding and then reaching out to employers. Um, so we have the education, we have the classes, we provide the training that gets students ready for industry certifications. And then we also have, what, what we're looking for is that guided work experience so that students can take what they've learned in the classroom, do the job that they're trained to do, uh, earn and learn, as Adele mentioned, um, get mentoring from people that are in the industry, um, and really focus on their mastery of those skills that they're learning in the classroom. Next slide. So what we did at Cabrillo, we, we have one local employer who did their own registered standard, and our standards are registered with the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, this has been, like I said, about four years ago, and at that time, the Department of Apprenticeship Standards in California and the U.S. Department of Labor um, had sort of different pathways. They've now come together and, and having both is much easier, as Adele mentioned. But this, uh, the American Apprenticeship Grant was from the Department of Labor, so our standard is registered with them. Uh, Cloud Brigade, who is a local employer, they have their own, they are their own sponsor and they're the registered standard. But what we found is that because the size of companies in Santa Cruz is smaller, um, many companies did not want to um, go through the, the effort that is required of filing that, that standard with either State of California or the USDOL. So we created our own standard for computer support specialist and desktop support technician and also web developer. And so we have registered the standard at Cabrillo. And as an employer, you can join in our standard and, and place a, a student at your own company and work to the standard. Next slide. Ours is a hybrid model. Adele mentioned that also. It's typically one year, so it's both competencies as well as time served. Um, the scope and the time are defined in the standards, and, but the employer can do some customization. Um, they are defined to have the final journey worker wage at about $20, which is a, 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 a typical entry-level job point of wage uh, for IT workers and with little experience. So in this case, they'd have you know their education plus a year or so experience. The training pre-requirements are the classes that we offer at Cabrillo. And then while they're in their apprenticeship, 
they do related technical instruction. That's the USDOL acronym, RTI versus RSI. And they take additional classes. The combination of these classes gives that student um, a certificate of achievement, or they can join those classes along with general ed and have an associate's degree by the, by the time they're completing this. Um, we at the college do the career preparation training. We help the student with their portfolio, the pre-screening. So once the employer who has joined into us with our program as an employer sponsor, once they have said, okay, I have a position open, we will give them a student that has taken these pre-requirement classes and that we've worked with on their resume and their interviewing skills. Next slide. So I mentioned our degrees. We do have two associate's degrees plus certificates of achievement and skills certificates. All of those are essentially less time and less semesters to get to that point. And we are also working on an AS transfer degree for information technology. Next slide. This is a very, a little bit of an eye chart, but I think you'll get these slides, right, Haley? They'll get these slides um, after this session. But you can see our different classes and the uh, training pathways that we offer. And I think that's my last slide. Yep. Thank you so much. And we'll answer questions at the end. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosie Armstrong. And as Haley mentioned, I'm a director of workforce development here at Hartnell College. Really glad to have this opportunity to speak with you all and learn and continue to learn about the, the apprenticeship waters, if, if you may. So I think that fits perfect within the apprenticeship, um, our apprenticeship uh, sailing theme today. So I wanna tell you about our uh, longstanding uh, traditional apprenticeship program, which is our electrical apprenticeship program offered through our Tri-County Electrical Joint Apprenticeship Training Committee. Um, it is a co-collaboration between uh, union and management, both NECA and IBU. And I can tell you this program has been offered since the early to, early to mid 1970s, so quite a long time. It is also the only state and federal registered electrical apprenticeship uh, program in the Monterey Bay, serving the tri-county areas of Santa Cruz, Monter Monterey County, and and uh, San Benito County. Next slide, please. So I'd also like to tell you what an electrical apprentice does. And I think we've heard a couple key, the key themes and keywords today, uh, journeyman, mentorship. The, the electrical apprentice works under the supervision of a journeyman electrician or journey person electrician, I should say. They install and maintain a variety of equipment, whether it's radio, heat, light, think of also traffic lights. And they're able to work in multiple areas of occupancy, whether it's residential, commercial, or uh, industrial. Next slide, please. So before I get into the program details, um, I'd like to also tell you a little bit more about why apprenticeships are really important to Hartnell College, as well as the region. Hartnell College is a recent recipient of the Better Careers uh, at Hartnell College grant as offered by James Irvine. And the point of that grant and the goal of the grant is to link college to career systems through employer engagement, like we have here today, um, also to look at gaps that currently exists between college and career. And then most importantly, link our internships, uh, internships, job placement and apprenticeship systems together across the college. So I, I'm proud to say that we have a new career hub that will be opening uh, this semester at Hartnell College. And we have recently filled uh, the directorship with Belen Gonzalez, who as many of you know, has been our coordinator of jobs and internship placement but we'll be taking over uh, as that director. So, so let me tell you about the details um, of this program here. It's a little bit of a hybrid structure and you'll see quite a bit of hours. This is as again, approved per standards of the JATC. 8,000 hours of on the job training, also inclusive of 10, semester, 10 semesters of 
also what we call RSI. We will often uh, talk about two different forms of RSI. So that's not Montoya funds in this case, but related supplemental instruction. The coursework takes place at our um, the IBU uh, Casterville Center on Merritt Street, and that's that happens two nights per week. The wages for the electrical apprenticeship, as you can see, are about start about twenty four dollars an hour, and that is without experience. The cost for that program is traditionally been funded by the Education and Training Contributions um, Committee per their CBA. Uh, there is no tuition charge for apprentices, but there's typically a, a book fee of $200 per year. There's a caveat with that. Um, sometimes it is refunded by those um, any specific uh, grant awards. At the end of the apprenticeship, our, our apprentices do receive a journeyman certificate. And uh, as Adele mentioned earlier, like other programs, this program is also duly approved by the DOL and the state and also is uh, also receives veteran benefits as well for uh, further uh, benefit for further contribution. Next slide, please. So there are some minimum requirements of this program and I also included a link for the application. Uh, the requirements include being age 18 or older, providing a college transcript, official college transcript, high, excuse me, I'm saying college, sorry, community college here, uh, providing a sealed transcript of the high, high school education and training diploma or GED requirements, uh, that you qualify for the NJATC electrical trades aptitude test, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it basically includes reading comprehension as well as algebra and other math functions, uh, passage of a drug screen test and uh, possession of a driver's license. And again, there is no experience required here. So I just wanna emphasize that. Next slide, please. So the in terms of those basic qualifications, as I mentioned, there is the written exam, which includes uh, algebra and the reading comprehension. I've also included a link here for some resources for those that want to prepare for the exam. Um, some courses, there are courses here that are offered at no cost and then some that are at a minimal cost. So please take a look at that link. It's super helpful and it's been recommended by both IBU and NECA. Upon completion of the written exam, uh, qualified applicants will, uh, will be approved for an oral interview. And those that interview at, um, excuse me, those who receive a passing interview, sco interview score uh, will have their name placed on a rankings list, which, will, um, which they'll remain on for a two year period. Those that receive, the highest or oral interview scores are also will also rise to the top of the apprenticeship um, apprenticeship list. I, and before, and I just wanted to plug one more thing. So I'm really proud to have a few of my colleagues uh, on this call as well today that I see from Bright Beginnings, Laura Keeley, Saldana, and our Adult Ed Consortium. Uh, Slings Valley Adult Ed Consortium Director Ivan Pigan. And they are here also um, with some good news as we are launching a new apprenticeship program in early college education, excuse me, early childhood education. And um, they'll be glad to answer some questions as they come up in the Q&A. So I'm um, just thrilled that they're here. I want to emphasize co-collaboration in co-creation today, because that's absolutely what apprenticeships are about. And we cannot do that without the strength of that ecosystem and community. So thank you for being here. All right, thank you for um, Adele, Terry, and Rosie for your presentations. We're gonna move into an open Q&A. We'll stop the recording. Uh, we just want everyone to feel comfortable asking questions and, um, move into just the more informal part of our event where you know we, we've got these experts on the line. So please 